2021 revival right behind me. Mr. Hoke, I'm gonna beat you to your comment. All right, it's a Devil Runner 135, so it's a moonshine horsepower, 135 cubic inch Devil Runner engine in it. And every time we do one, Mr. Hoke's like, hey, another 135. Well, one of the reasons you see so many 135s is guys want a ton of power. These make 170 plus horsepower typically. And our bigger motors are just monsters. They're just insane. A 139, 143, they make upwards of 180 plus horsepower. I was riding mine at the 120th anniversary in Milwaukee, doing 20 mile an hour, doing a stoplight, or it was probably a stop sign I was going to, and I just whacked my gas once really, really quick, and it sent my front tire to the moon. Not everyone needs that monster beneath them. For those that do, we got you covered. But most riders, they're looking for something like this that they can tour cross country, have passing power, beat all their buddies that think they have a bad boy motor, and still roll the miles. So we break down these motors a lot. A 135 from us is a four and a half inch stroke. Now Harley just released their new 135. There's a stroke, smaller bore. Ours is the same four and a half inch stroke that comes stock on a 114, but we took the bore and we increased the bore bigger. Anytime we can do the extra cubic inch in bore, we're going to because it keeps the piston speed down, the rings are happier, the piston's happier, and the bigger the bore is, the bigger the valve we can stick in the motor. So the lower end on this guy is a dark horse flywheel. It has a pair of Carrillo rods in it, and it has the dark horse pin that is pushed into the middle of the normal pin for extra support, and it, it makes it more rigid, so there's less flex in the pin that the bearings are riding on. That's the lower end of your connecting rod. And then they true them, they TIG weld them on the end so it can't move, it can't scissor. The bearings are replaced by dark horse, Everything in the rods are checked out to make sure they're round, make sure they're straight, and then they're putting them together when they build the flywheel. So on top of this, a pair of our 135, which they are a 4.375 inch piston with a pair of total seal rings on them. And the piston's top ring groove is gas ported. That way we get a little more tension on that top compression ring. It's a better ring seal. Um, you're gonna get less oil blow by it's going to make more power. It's a very nice setup. It's an advanced profile top ring from Total Seal. Now this bike, when we originally built it, it had the black highlight cylinders. And now if you look at her, she's got a pair of our Moonshine Horsepower CNC Game Changer cylinders that the customer elected to have us fully show polish the cylinders and we show polish the heads for a really cool look. This bike's nice because it's all chromed out. So when we have the polished cylinders in the heads with the chrome rocker covers, the chrome cam cover, it really pulls the bike together. On these bigger 135s, we go with the Moonshine Horsepower 588 camshaft. So it's 0.588 inches of lift, so a little over half an inch of lift, and it closes at 44 degrees. So it's right in the middle between our high horsepower cams and the real torquey cams on the bottom. And this thing's got the extra cubic inch, so even as soon as you roll onto this, if you check out the dyno sheet, it's 130 plus foot pounds of torque, 21, 2200 RPMs. That is a lot of torque. That's more torque than the Harley 131 is making at their peak when that motor's maxed out in its torque curve. This is making it as soon as we roll onto it. It is holding over 155 from about 3,500 RPMs all the way to 6,000 RPMs. So in the meet, when you're getting into and you're playing with your buddies, it's making max torque and it's holding it out for a long period of time. And of course, we pass 160 horsepower at about 5,400 RPMs. It made max power at 171 horsepower at 6,500 RPMs. 
and it holds it all the way to 7,000 RPMs. If we look at this dyno graph, it's just a nice linear torque curve, horsepower shoots to the moon. I mean, as soon as you see it hit about 4,300 RPMs, you can really see the torque curve and the horsepower curve really take off again, and the horsepower sings all the way to 170 plus. Monster motor when you want it to be. And the exhaust on this guy right here, it looks stock. This is our full sleeper. If you want a bike that will pretty much take out majority of stuff out on the street and you want to look stock, this has our Moonshine Horsepower Pro Stock header. The reason we like the Pro Stock header is one, it's made in America. It's made by one of the best companies in the exhaust games, Burns Stainless Steel, and it fits behind the Harley Davidson factory heat shields. Two reasons that make it a sleeper. It's behind the factory heat shields and you really can't see the pipe until you really get up close and you kind of look behind it. The second reason is the four and a half inch Moonshine Horsepower mufflers really tame this motor down and they make it where you can ride with your buddies and they're not gonna be like, hey, you gotta ride in the back, you gotta do this because you're just murdering everyone's eardrums. This is really mild. Now when you crack it and she's wide open, she's gonna let everyone know that she's got some bark. But cruising, idling, you could tell it's something in it, but you'd have no idea that this 135 is in this bike and it's 170 horsepower. This complete sleeper setup on here, we designed this exhaust to work with a stock motor. We love it on the MHP 45 camshafts, which we put on the stage two, and it performs well on 135 cubic inch Devil Runner. So it will work with all those setups, fits underneath the package heat shield. This is our Moonshine Horsepower Pro Stock header and Pro Stock full system because it is paired with our four and a half inch Pro Stock mufflers. So you can get just the head pipe, which is the Pro Stock header that's underneath the factory heat shields. You can buy just the muffler, which these are the MHP Pro Stock muffler, or you can buy it in combination and get the full system. The other cool thing about going underneath the factory heat shields is Harley Davidson puts a lot of research. They spend a lot of time making the bikes comfortable. And what they did with this rear exhaust pipe is they kept it close to the motor as they could to bring it down. Because the farther away they get it from your leg when you're sitting on this bike, the less heat you as a rider feel. When we do a D&D, &D, we do a Thunder header, um, you do all the other exhausts where they swing way out and we actually have to trim this heat shield, that's getting six inches, four inches, five inches, six inches closer to your leg. The closer that exhaust gets to your leg, the more heat you're feeling. Every inch it's farther away is <laughs> that much in degrees of heat you're gonna lose. I'm gonna say every six inches or every inch it's away from your leg, it, it's like a 20 degree difference you're gonna feel on the back side of your leg. And the Chrome from Harley, we never have a problem with rust. We never have a problem with it flaking off like some of the aftermarket companies have. Their finishes are tried, true, and really nice because it goes through all their R&D and their quality control before it makes it into production and on the motorcycle. Now to go with the classic look on this guy, we went with the SNS mini teardrop cover. That right there is on top of the SNS plus one stealth air cleaner setup. This motor, we ran a 64 millimeter throttle body because you can get over 200 horsepower plus on a 64 millimeter throttle bike. You don't need a 68, a 70 to get 200 horsepower. They will make it. Now they're out there and you can get them, but you don't have to have them. This has our 70 millimeter manifold, which is our monster manifold with a big square port flanges that go into the heads and the heads have the square port as well to feed those two big intake valves. But it goes from a 70 to a 64 right from Harley Davidson. Now we make them where you can get a 70 as well, but on the dyno on a 135, 139s, we haven't seen any additional horsepower on street cams with the Harley Davidson throttle body, which is the 64 millimeter. Everyone's always asking, hey, what, what oil pump and plate do we run? Which one's the best? Well, my personal bike, whether it's my drag bike or my road bike, I'm running the Screaming Eagle oil pump and plate in my bike. Harley started racing King of the Baggers, and the best thing about them getting involved in racing is they're testing more parts, they're pushing more parts to the limit, and that allows them to learn, 
research, develop other things to bring to the market to make them better. So they came out with that oil pump when they were having issues with the King of the Baggers the first year they were out there. The second year they had the brand new pump and plate. They brought it out for their race bike and now it's available for everyone through the Screaming Eagle catalog. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that plate will only handle plus 570, 575 maybe lift exhaust. So if you have a cam that has over a 570 lift exhaust, we index the back of the plate. We take about, I think we take 60 thousandths out of the back of the cam plate so we can clear our big cams. We can clear a Star Racing 615 camshaft with our modified Screaming Eagle oil pump and plate that we sell. The lifters, our go-to lifters are the Johnson lifters and the only way to get a pair of Harley Davidson um, adequate Johnson lifter is through fueling. Fueling has the lifters. They are the race series lifters. They are made by Johnson. They have a standard travel and they have a short travel. In this guy, we have the short travels. Now, a lot of the motors we run, if you're buying our MHP 45 camshaft, we're gonna use a standard travel. It's gonna quiet down the valve train and everything else. When we're going to 135s and bigger, that's when we decide to take that lifter and go to a short travel. Push rods. We have the Screaming Eagle adjustable push rods in this motor. The heads on this guy, those are a pair of our MHP monster heads that are show polished. So when we do a heads that are show polished, it takes longer time because we gotta get the heads built. We gotta send them out to be show polished. Um, we only use one guy and it takes a little bit longer to get them done. But when they're done and you're trying to do a show bike, you're trying to stand out from the crowd. Amazing look. All the monster heads are equipped with 2.5 millimeter oversized valves in them and we do them in both. We do them in a, a head that's less expensive and they're gonna have stainless steel intake and exhaust valves in them. And then we do them in a pair that have the titanium intakes and the Inconel exhaust. So we have two different options. We have a stainless steel intake option and we have the titanium intake option. Just different pricing range in there, um, both available from us. And you have to run our Monster Series intake manifold because we're the only ones out there that have a square port intake runner into the head. We developed that years ago, and it's just because we needed to feed those extra valves. The, the surface area of the valve, the curtain area, was requiring more area entering the head, which required more area through the manifolds. And that's when we came out with that intake manifold. And, and that's what makes these bikes so responsive. That's what makes the torque curve and the horsepower on these a little bit more than some of the other stuff you see on the market. And they're just complete monsters. Now, when you have 171 horsepower, do you always need a bigger transmission? And, and that's a question that I'm asked a lot. Hey, when do you go to chain? When do you go to a Baker Grudge Box transmission? And what I tell most riders is, it depends on you. The belt, they hold up fine. I have a 182 horsepower on my 139, I'm running a belt on my bike. I'm not dumping the clutch. I'm not doing rolling burnouts all the time. I'm not always trying to wheelie. I'll rock a wheelie once in a while. I'll get on it nice and, and aggressive, but I'll roll a nice uh, power wheelie rolling into it and the belt handles it fine. It's when you're snapping the throttle or you're dumping the clutch over and over where you're shocking that belt over and over. That's when you want to go to the chain. Now the chain has more maintenance. It's louder. Um, you have to lube it, you have to clean it, but if you don't want to be on a trip riding with your guys and maybe have a belt rip in half, which is not an easy fix, the chain is, you know, your security blanket to not having a problem later down the road. Um, it, it's up to you. You can do them either ways. It depends on the rider. Same thing with the transmission. You're shifting properly. You're getting out of the throttle. You're grabbing a little bit of clutch. You're getting back into it and you're not dumping the clutch all the time. The, the stock transmission, they hold up to these motors. We have plenty of motors making 180 plus horsepower of stock transmission. But there's a couple other factors. It's the rider, it's how you're operating the motorcycle. And then the other thing is, is what are you running for a compensator? What are you running for a clutch? Sometimes when you're giving all that power, if you have a lockup clutch on your bike, there's no give there. When there's no give in the clutch, it puts a lot more shock into the transmission and that's usually when we see broken transmissions or broken belts. So we never put a lock up on a bike unless you have some kind of crazy horsepower drag bike that's producing 200 horse and we need a lock up to run it on the dyno. But sometimes even the big drag bikes making over 200 horse, we're not putting the lock ups on the track because a little slip is good. Too much slip is bad. So you got to tune it, but that, that's only drag brace bikes, you know, we're talking 
190 plus horsepower and race gas. Our comp of choice is gonna be the design Harley came out with because they have a, a lot of time on this and there's a reason they have that compensator ratchet as much as it does. So we take the compensator ramp and we make it out of billet steel, which is tool steel. And it's made by Liberty Gear for us and it's made in America, and we have never, ever seen a broken one. We run those on our race bikes too for you guys. We're like, hey, I'm high performance, I'm gonna be racing. That is what is in our drag bikes. If you're drag racing, we want that because when you leave the tree and hit, you want a little bit of that so you don't just blow the rear tire off. And it's gonna make everything last as long. You go with some other compensators out there, and we see it prematurely wear bearings in your, your transmission. We see it really hit the clutch basket where your plates are in between your clutch basket and they're held there. We see those really get worn quickly. So there's a reason why we have now gone back to the Harley design with a piece that we had Liberty Gear make. That way we don't have to worry about failures later down the road. So now that we've gone over this power plant, anytime you have a bike that's gonna accelerate a lot harder, you should typically look at increasing your brakes. And when I say increasing, increasing your stopping power. I want you to, instead of it take 100 yards to stop, I want you to be able to stop in 70. And the only way to do that is to really increase the size of your rotor, and it's to make your rotor taller, and it's to get a better caliper. So right here is a pair of full floating rotors. Um, these are what we try to run on all of our heavier bikes because the inner of the rotor is hitting the outer rotor, and it's not putting all of the pressure on the buttons. So we like this design because of that. Kraus does awesome work. We work directly with Kraus on either our custom applications where we need something for a bike or when we're going to a normal setup and someone's like, hey, what do I want to do for brakes? We always go to Kraus Moto for the axial to radial brake setup. And right here on the front, that's a pair of their CNC machined axial to radial brake mounts and we are running a pair of four piston chrome Behringer calipers. And anytime we do these, we measure the lines for every bike because we want the lines to look really good. We want to look like the factory designed them. So that is what we are doing to the front of this bike. And of course it's a Turing chassis, so it's got dual rotors. You got dual Behringers on the front. The rear, we don't go with full floating rotors on the rear. And the reason we don't put the full floating rotor on the rear is this bike, you know, you're, you're talking 900,000 pounds. And when you are using just the rear brake and you're trying to stop a thousand pounds with just one rotor, we like the solid rotor in the rear. It's gonna hold up longer, it's more robust, and we choose to go with a thicker rotor on the rear of these when we go to them. Of course, it's a bigger size, and we have the same kind of bracket we have in the front. We have the Kraus Moto axial to radial uh, caliper mount on the rear. This one's machined, and of course, we're running the same caliper we're running on the front. The Behringer caliper that's on the front is the same exact one. It's just hidden under the bag so you can't see it. The only thing to keep in mind when you are doing a, a Behringer caliper on the back of your motorcycle, the bleeder is right here. So on the front, they're on the top. When you take this caliper and you're on the rear and you position it here, your bleeder is now on the bottom. You can't bleed the air out of the brakes without the bottom. So what we do to bleed the Behringers and we're going through the process in our shop we have an extra rotor we keep on hand. We take the, the Behringer off of where it's mounted. We put it on a rotor we have, takes two guys, one guy holds it and bleeds it. The other guy is pumping it or we're using a vacuum on it to bleed it. But that way it's being bled with the bleeder at the highest point instead of at the bottom. Because I've seen some comments where like, hey, you can't run that, the bleeder's on the bottom, it's designed wrong. Well, it wasn't designed to be ran that way, but we bleed them correctly. And once they're bled, you don't have to worry about there in the lines anymore. Then we reinstall them the way that Cross Moto designed the bracket. And they're, they're phenomenal. I mean, it, it's nice when you get a Harley and you now have the sport bike feel where it's just the tap instant brake instead of the sponginess. The front's the same way. You got that quick tap. It, it's, if you came off a sport bike and you went to a Harley, that's one of the things you probably miss the most. When you go to a brake setup like this, you get that feel back on your bagger and, and it's nice. And then you have all the confidence of the extra braking. You've increased the braking area. You've increased the strength of the calipers and it, it, it's a lot more positive feel and you're gonna have confidence in your brakes. Now, once you're braking harder 
and you have a lot more brakes on it, that front end's gonna dive harder. So anytime you, 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 know, you open Pandora's box, it leads to the next one and the next one. So this guy got a pair of GP uh, cartridge drop-ins and it's a 25 millimeter cartridge kit. The reason we do the GPs is they're fully tunable. You have your preload, which is on both forks. You have compression on one, your rebound on the other. I will show you on this bike, but it is a Batwing. So when you run the Batwing bike, it is covered up. The other thing with the Batwing bike that makes it a little harder is when you're trying to tune your suspension, you gotta remove more pieces to do it. Not as easy as a road glide, or if you're working with a soft tail or a different bike where the forks are visible. On the rear, we got a pair of Olins, O44s. And sometimes we go with the Olins instead of the Screaming Eagle because when we get an Olin shock from Olins, we can pick the spring we want, depending on your weight the passenger weight, your luggage, we can tell Owens exactly what you're putting on the bike and we're gonna get a spring matched to that. Now, if you buy a pair of Screaming Eagle Olin shocks, they take the same spring, so the Olin shock changes. The only difference is, is from your dealership, the Screaming Eagle shock comes with a medium setup and it's set up for most riders weights in the middle. If you're gonna be heavy loaded down, it's probably too light of a spring. If you're a real light rider and you're not taking a passenger, it's probably a little bit too heavy of a spring, but Quick call to Owens. You can tell them what you're doing, what shock you have, and you can swap out your springs for your Screaming Eagle Owens rear suspension on your bike. Or if you have a pair of Owens you bought from your dealer and you want to figure out what they are, the spring numbers on the side, you can call Owens. They can tell you if that's the right spring for your bike. Because sometimes you want to play around with your tuning and get it perfect. Or you just want to change your setup because you think it could be better. That is an option on either shock. These ones, we kind of like them up front. When we are running the Owens shocks, and you're running a tour pack setup or a backrest, we are going to mount that remote reservoir in front of the bag. And the reason being is because if we mount them back here with the Kraus Moto uh, brackets, you can't run a backrest, you can't run a tour pack like this. This is um, one of my favorite tour pack setups because it is a backrest for the rider. You don't see these a lot, but they're really cool. And it looks good paint matched on the Revival. Harley had the paint matched tour pack option. Customer liked to go with that. Real nice look. He's cruising a ton of miles. He's about to ride this all the way back to Virginia today. We're picking up in Tennessee, riding all the way back to VA on this bike. And this, set, this bike's set up to cruise. Now, whether you're either purchased or you're looking at getting the Screaming Eagle Olins, or you have these Olins, both of them are fully adjustable. Both of them have preload, which is the collar on top of the spring. You can turn those down to increase the preload. You can loosen them to decrease the preload. And of course, you have your compression which is right on your reservoirs. So compression's on the reservoir, rebound is on the bottom of the shock, there's a collar. There's rebound on the bottom of the shock and if you have the Olins, you have height adjustability because they have a heim joint on the bottom that can be screwed into the shock with a lock nut and you have about half an inch. Maybe a little bit more to play with for total shock length where you can add or decrease from that bottom heim joint on the bottom of the shock. Make sure if you are doing that adjustment, you read your manual. The paperwork and all this stuff is good. For you guys that throw that paperwork to the side, save it. There's something in the instructions that says, hey, we have machined a groove in the threads of this heim joint. And if you go past that, it is unsafe. If you can see that out the bottom of the shock after the lock nut, you've gone too far. There's a warning in there. Make sure you read that. Make sure you don't have that line sticking out past your lock nut on the bottom of the shocks, whether you have the Screaming Eagle ones or the ones right directly from Olin's. That is our go-to shock. In our minds, Olin's king of the heap. If you go to the racetrack and you watch GP racing, you watch sport bike racing, you're into it, you're at king of the baggers, Olin's has their engineers at the track helping the riders set up their bikes. Some guys have teams with that guy. Some guys actually pay Olin's to help them with their team. So. It's just another level of suspension and they got into the Harley Road probably about four years ago and they kind of put their toe in and now they're, they're completely into it. The market has really taken off. It is my shock of choice for any of the Harley Davidsons. On this video, you see the bars behind me, but we've done it two ways. We've had him with his bigger apes. I got to talk to him, he's on his way to pick it up because we just got done with it again for him. But he had the Krauss Moto bars on it. And those are the bars that I really liked. I think he's a big guy, maybe wanted a different seating position for the riding he's doing. And I think one of the reasons is, is because he's leaning back on the backrest right here. And he's cruising. And I think he wanted his hands out here because the cross moto bars, 
you're more upright in here. So I think with leaning on the backrest, cruising with his feet out, he wants something a little bit more comfortable, like a Yonda bar. It's not a Yonda bar, but we're in the position you would be possibly on the Yonda bike. And, uh, you know, those are made to go Yonda. <laughs> I don't think we can put that in. This is Mr. Butch Literal, yep. and he is the owner of this night. <laughs> he is the owner of one of the baddest Harley Davidson revivals ever produced. And uh, he's back here. He's changed up a couple things from the build that we did last time. We switched it up from a black highlighted motor to a fully polished motor. And every time he comes back, he adds another part. Come on, we got we got to show this girl off. That's right. Is it a girl or boy? What are you riding? It's Lucille. Okay. <laughs> it's Lucille. Shoot. Lucille, we got to show her off. The so, red one's Ruby. This is Lucille. Well, talk to me a little bit about what it was, what you have now, and, and the differences, if you could. It was a stock 114. Stock. And it rode like it was stock. And all the suspension, what we did to that motor, the guys can't keep up with me when I take off, but I'm old. <laughs> I don't want to go that fast. You know? Right. What I like about it, I can be going down the road in fifth gear and just crack the throttle open and look down, and I'm going way, 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 uh, way faster. These big motors, before you know it, you're doing 100 plus quickly. Yeah. yeah. Quickly. Yeah. And you don't have to downshift like you would on the other ones. Right. Um, so we, we had a pair of Krauss Moto Bars on here with the Fly Moto Bars. It looked awesome. Yep. Randy, roll a video of that. Boop, here it is. Look. So that's my favorite setup. But there's a reason we have different bars, different seats, different suspension, different motor builds for everyone because, you know, depending on your riding style and your seating position, it might not be exactly what you want. I mean, that's what you want for cornering. Right. But for cruising, and you put some miles on this guy. I just ride. I just, I just ride. How many miles did I have on it when we got it? First time, probably about 3,500. 3,500. So you got, you got almost... I that 3,000 miles on her. Right. And but, then I decided I needed another transmission. Well, you know, <laughs> five-year warranty, uh, if anything there, breaks. There you go. The stock trainees hold up, depending on you as a rider, which I explained a little bit early in this video. Butch wasn't here yet. He was on an airplane landing in Nashville when I went over it. But you don't have to go with the Baker Grudge Box. Now, if you want a warranty with your transmission, Baker, the company they are, they provide that five-year warranty with their transmission. It is a stronger transmission, but it depends on how you're riding the bike, maybe how you are beating on your bike, and some of the stuff you have in your clutch. Right. You know, like we don't do lockups on our clutches because when there's a little give, we want the clutch to slip a little bit and have a little forgiveness in it so it just doesn't rip teeth off, maybe right. second or third gear. Right. And um, besides the Baker, did you want to change your gear ratio or were you just looking for something stronger? I was just looking for something stronger. I've got warranty on every, now I've got warranty on the whole bike. Well, I think the, the main reason he did the Baker is because it came polished. Like everything else. <laughs> Why not? He you saw know? there's a polished option. He's like, that'll match. Yep. I'll do the Baker. Right. Um, but when you do have more horsepower and you are cruising at highway speeds, you know, the Baker has an overdrive in it. So if you want to cruise at 90 on a bike, which we don't recommend. That's right. But you're able to do it. The Baker will cruise 90 like you're cruising 70 in six on a normal transmission. And it, it makes a big difference if you are riding at that mile per hour. The Revival, this series right here, the Icon series is my favorite. This was the first year. This was the first one. 2021, right. you have the Electric Glide Revival, which was numbered. There were only 1,500 made. 2022, we have the El Diablo. And then for 2023, Highway King, which you just I, bought. I have a magenta. A magenta. Yeah. I'm an orange guy. Butch, he's a magenta guy. They're both cool. Yeah. My favorite part about it, which I talked to the designer, Brad, at Harley, was the tinted windshield. Right. You know, because you don't see those anymore. Yeah. It's like a, a long lost art for customizing motorcycles. But back in the day, I remember when they had all kinds of cool colors on them. Blue was very popular. I think that was a cool touch. Um, since you put about 3,000 miles on this bike, besides the power, what else do you like about having a beast beneath you? I like the way it handles. When I go around corners, I like the way it handles. And I like the, if I'm going, if I'm, it's so forgiving. If, I, if I'm going too slow and I feel like I'm going to drop the bike, all I do is get gas and it sits right back up. 
Well, that's what your dad always taught you when you were little, My right? My dad didn't. No. Okay. Right? Yeah. You well, remember what we taught you? What is? What's the saying? <laughs> when you're like five and you're talking to your kid and you just crash for the first time. All right. I don't remember, man. Here it goes. I remember it vividly. I'm on the ground. He's picking me up. I'm kind of like dusting myself off, about to cry. He's like, son, when in doubt, throttle out. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you learn when your little kid gets squirrel. You give it gas, it kind of straightens back up. Well, that's what this thing does for me. You yeah. Know? I mean, that 114 I have at home, if it starts to fall over, if I let it go too far, it ain't, it ain't going to recover. Yeah. But this thing will. Yeah. You know, and just the way I changed the seat on it, and the way we've got it sitting lower, it just, it's like I'm sitting in the bike well, instead of on the bike. Right, and especially with this tour pack on here. So this is a, a tour pack. This is a paint matched tour pack from Harley Davidson. It is their chop tour pack, so it's not the king, it's the chop tour pack. But what I like about it, and you don't see this often, is when you set it up to be the backrest for the rider. We always see them on the back right. for, you know, the wife, the passenger, whoever else is on the back. But how cool is it that the weight's not really far behind the bike? It's centered over the rear wheel, and now you can lean on it, and you have all this extra space for luggage for touring. Right. Makes a huge difference. When yeah. I go on long trips, I actually set my bike up just like this. Yeah. The only thing is, is my handlebars, since they're set up more for performance, the only way I, I have to lean back to get to my backrest, so sometimes, you know, it, I have to move this far forward, which I have to customize it a little bit, but lean back like you are, get your feet prepped up on your highway pegs. Right. And now you change the bars to be taller and farther back. I mean, you have the full road sofa bike. If you were talking to your buddies or talking to someone that was trying to do this for the first time, what should they know about maybe a bigger motor, maybe about performance brakes or suspension? I mean, if you were to do one thing first, would you do one thing before the other? Well, on the the other bike that I have, I did the suspension. The one that I just bought, I did the suspension. I started there. I made arrangements to bring it up here and do everything. So you and I made another deal, and now I'm like, okay, let's wait. It'll probably end up getting done, but it's not going to get done until until I get the CVO. Well, when you when you buy a 2023 CVO, it sets you back a little bit. Yeah. I got one on order for me because I got a. I got to tinker with some pieces in there. Yeah. The heads are new. Right. It's a new port on the head. It's no longer a circle. It is a unique egg-looking port. A oval, a oval it, port. Right? Yeah, it's an egg because it's smaller on one side than the other. Right. And then the intakes change. The variable valve timing's in there, and it works off of oil pressure. So real cool stuff. Um, the bike runs really good out of the box. So you're going to be impressed with it. They were all over Milwaukee. We just got back from the 120th anniversary. And um, Harley had probably 50 of those bikes out there for people to test ride, demo, and see, right. which is good. Uh, we'll have it in a couple months, probably. Did you get the orange? You got the orange one. Yeah. Orange one's delayed. Anyone buying an orange CVO, the the whiskey neat? Yep. It's gonna take a little longer to get that bike because it is that custom paint. If you haven't seen it already, go to harley-davidson.com. Watch the CVO videos. It's not your run-of-the-mill paint job. It is a custom airbrush. Um, they spend a lot of time designing it. It takes more time to produce some at the paint facility, and they are going to be more limited production. I bought the silver one because I wanted it quicker. Right. But the whiskey you had to have it. Yeah, I had to have it That's before right. those come out. That's right. But um, either way, they're, they're amazing bikes. The whiskey knee is an unbelievable paint job in person. And Harley even took the time of making the fairing have little shapes to them that reflect light. So you see different tones and stuff in the paint job, which is kind of cool. Right, right. Well, anything you want to tell someone that if this was their, they were going to do this, what you would say? Or someone that's on the fence teetering, advice? Yeah, if you come do it, do it all at one time. <laughs> so you don't got to come back. That's what I, you know, I asked Nick how many times I talked to him. Yep. I changed the plan three times. Then after I brought it out here, we changed the plan again. Yep. And y'all did what we have now. Yep. The one thing that I talk about the Moonshine Horsepower Pro Stock header is it's a full sleeper because no one realizes that this motor, I mean, besides it being show polish and all the stuff on it, they don't realize it's 135 cubic inch and 170 plus horsepower. Right. And with the bike idling, you really don't know it either. I've ridden with people and they're like, everybody that does that to their bikes, they all sound so obnoxious and this thing's quiet. Right. Even when I hit the gas, that's the only time you can really. Hear it, hear it. How is it to ride? 
It does. I don't have to wear earplugs. Well, no, as far as its, um, it's behavior, because sometimes we build motors and they're very aggressive and, you know, it, it's a lot of bike, but I rode your bike today. Yeah. And I was surprised. I just let out the clutch nice and easy. It's not over aggressive on the sound. Right. And, and it was very easy for me to ride. It's easy for me to ride. I mean, it's tame in a parking lot, and so you don't want it to be tame. Yeah. It's yeah. tame on the street, so you don't want to be tame. Yeah, and that, and that part's cool. And that's why when Mr. Hoax says it's another 135 and he puts his comment down there, there's a reason. <laughs> we build so many of these because 170 plus horsepower and it's tamer to ride. It's not abrupt. It's not like you're driving a, you know, just this mammoth around all the time. It will be a mammoth when you want it to be. Now, Mr. Hoax, we know you wanted a mammoth. We have customers out there, riders out there that want mammoths. Oh, but that's not what everyone wants in every bike. You I know? watched your video with him. Yeah, I watched it. You two are handfuls. I mean, he, he's like, yeah, they can't even keep up with me. I'm like, yeah, I don't. The only time they can't keep up with me is when we take off because once we get going, I'm not going much over 100 miles an hour, period. I'm just not yeah. doing it. You, you know? just get fair roll off of it. Right. My girlfriend's like, go get your bike and go for a ride because I've been talking about this for like two weeks. <laughs> I bet you know, you I've been ready. I bet you have. We've been ready. You know? <laughs> oh, man. And then when I. Jordan posted the videos for me to see the other day with him riding. I'm like, yeah, that's what I wanted because I guess you know I sent a message. It's got insurance on it. Ride it. I <laughs> don't did. care. We put some miles on it. Let you Jordan know. do it. Anyways, thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing that, that uh, magenta bike here. Yeah. Right? I he said it's going to take a long time to recover. It'll be here next month. I look forward to seeing the CVO here, okay? I'm going to work on it. That's I'm what I'm looking forward to.